What is a symbiote? It is defined as a close relationship between two species. Sometimes this is mutual, granting benefits to both. Commensalism offering the benefit to one without the harm of the other. But some are parasitic, infecting the host and feeding off of its organs, twisting and distorting them to the detriment of the host, even to death. These are all characteristics of a symbiote, but one venomous character has become synonymous with the symbiote. A character so popular on the back of its host that it can't help but infect the media of its opposition, at times to its benefit and at others, not so much. But let's leave that idea to fester while we focus on another, the concept of being underrated. When something is referred to as underrated, it is done as a means of explaining that the general public does not appreciate or value a product properly. If something is deemed overrated, then one believes that public opinion levies too much praise to a product. As I've made that very statement, I can bet that you have had at least one video game come to mind. I know I did. Arkham Origins. Originally the black sheep of the franchise, in recent years it has been hailed from the rooftops as being an underrated gem that didn't get its deserved praise because it had to fill the colossal boots of Arkham City. But at what point is an underrated gem no longer underrated? If the general public believes that a product is underrated, is it still underrated? This is a question that applies to today's subject, Spider-Man Web of Shadows, a game so underrated that I believe it has entered a new sphere. But let me pose a question first. What does one do when their favorite product is underrated? Simply, they convince others of its true value. But in attempts to do so, some have fallen victim to embellishing a product with hopes of selling it to their audience, leading the product itself to become distorted, at the detriment to itself. I am guilty of this. I was so convinced that the public was wrong about Assassin's Creed Unity that I was blind to the game's flaws. In discussions online, I have seen many, including myself, praise Web of Shadows as one of the most underrated and even one of the best Spider-Man games of our time. I don't believe these takes are wrong. Web of Shadows has some excellent mechanics and systems with some set pieces being etched into my mind, but perhaps we are elevating this game so high that it is becoming overrated. An overrated product breeds disappointment, which in itself perpetuates the overrated label until the poles shift again and the game is back to being underrated, which will bring lower and eventually exceeded expectations. These labels are ones that feed off of games like Web of Shadows, that have highs the likes of Everest but lows of the dirt. So let's take a look at what is supposedly one of the most underrated Spider-Man games and see if it is truly underrated, and how a parasite of its own has festered and corrupted it from within. But first, a word from today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive visual learning tool that offers courses ranging from the specifics of STEM, math, and computer science to broader applicable topics like logic and probability. You may recognize Brilliant as they have kindly sponsored the channel before, returning again thanks to your guys' support. The courses here are designed to be as intuitive and hands-on as possible, allowing you to see and feel how these topics like mathematics apply to your everyday life within finances, statistics, and more. I wish I had this when I was in high school, but thankfully I have it now. When I was in high school, I struggled greatly with math and sciences and had to pay hefty fees for tutors, but with Brilliant, not only is it more cost-effective, but it moves at your pace, meaning you can take advantage of those 3am bursts of ambition, or put in a quick 10 minutes before bed. There are thousands of lessons that feature hands-on interactive learning and there's new lessons added every month. The world needs more intelligence and brilliance. So to balance out the 12 hour overwatch benders that are destroying the synapses in your brain, why not explore and expand your knowledge of probability within casinos or quantitative finance? This is the most recent course I've been taking since signing up last month, and it discusses the risks and benefits to investing and how to use math to make the best investments possible. So if you want to keep learning, pass that upcoming test, invest wisely, or just flex on your friends, you can get a special offer of 20% off for the first 200 people to click the link in the description or the pinned comment. And thank you again to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. The streets of New York are initially normal, not quiet, but familiar. Trash litters the streets and buildings have interactable storefronts. Different districts are easily identified by their somewhat true to pop culture aesthetics. Comic book structures are here, like the Stark Tower that acts as the city's North Pole, but there's an invasion lurking here, and the benefits that the infection provides justifies the chaos. How do we get here? The first act of the game sees you in a familiar setting. High rises and petty crimes are the building blocks of gameplay, and while it isn't a bad feeling, it's too safe. 
Our inciting incident is when Venom begins reproducing like a jackrabbit, and his influence pops up, covering the walls and the streets with blemishes and bubonic boils infecting the citizens on a macro level. Ordinary people begin moving with spider-like mannerisms drawing immediate comparisons to our wall crawler, and it begins corrupting his reputation, especially when he himself now bears a similar dark complexion. By the time the symbiotes hit the fan, the entire city is covered in the alien organism. It creates a corruption that, while to the detriment of the inhabitants, is at the benefit of the experience. The third act is full of eye candy coated in a toxic glaze, with the scythe-like structures on the sides of buildings representing the venomous influence of Eddie. It's New York and its heart at their lowest point, and yet, I wish the third act could never end. I never replayed the game to experience its story, I replayed it to experience its city and ruins. But this, what is left of New York, is only held up by the foundation set in those opening hours. You must be accustomed to the calm to feel the brunt of the storm. But to prevent the player from getting too bored, we are stringed along by the webhead's most iconic villain. Venom is the first character we are shown past the cold open, a contrast. The other side of our webbed coin. On one side of Spider-Man is his classic suit, tied to his roots and closely chained to his morals. The other is his darker side, one who does what he wants, not what he must. Two sides that share the same body, yet contradict each other in existence. This contrast is reflected in every aspect of the game's opening. The beginning sees our hero, in his iconic red and blue spandex, simply walking. No agency, no helping those around him, and a lack of care for the battle he is obviously losing. Using, a contradiction of who Spider-Man is. Sonically, the music of Spider-Man often features horns, guitars, and a sense of triumph. Think of the orchestras of the Raimi trilogy and the web duology, and even the original cartoon, but the Moonlight Sonata that scores this opening is somber, with percussions at the forefront, and even the song itself, being a sonata yet sounding like a Fantasia, is a contrast. When we flash back to multiple days prior, we are given a run-of-the-mill battle against Venom that immediately indulges our desire for a clash between the two, yet it feels small in comparison to the chaos we saw before. Not a contradiction necessarily, but a duality. But this fight and opening is even more important because it highlights a strength within Web of Shadows. The spectacle is what carries a majority of the game, and especially the latter gauntlet of boss fights near the game's close. The stakes, the scale, the sheer insanity of what is in front of you. A game's first moment set the bar for what to expect, and typically, games will build off of that first moment. It's the baseline, and when your baseline is throwing cars and swapping between not just two suits, but two movesets, how much farther do we go from here? The answer is to incredible heights. Full scale prison breaks alternate paths, boss fights against every character twice, once in their classic form and again as they are corrupted by the symbiotes. An invasion that tears the physical city apart, turning its citizens into zombies, with the entire apocalypse culminating in a bona fide kaiju fight atop the shield helicarrier. Even the minor battles feature destruction, not dissimilar to comic-like action where cars are always exploding and Spider-Man gets reasonably shot back from an impact, which can destroy the storefronts of surrounding buildings. The city does have issues with pop-ins, but when moving at top speed it's hard to notice much of anything. Cutscenes are shot well and the character designs stand out as being unique but recognizable, even in the symbiote designs such as those for Electro, Wolverine, and the Vulture. These set pieces are clearly where a lot of the development time went, and while I'd love for a game to have the time to fully flesh out every aspect of its length, Web of Shadows did not receive this luxury. The development of this game was short, leading to certain aspects of the game stumbling in its execution, but the presentation seemed to suffer the least. Activision up to this point were beginning to grow tired of Spider-Man, and after the less than stellar critical reception of Spider-Man 3, people were looking for something fresh, which is where the developers of this game, Shaba Games, came in. They were given 17 months from start to finish to develop this game. Sacrifices had to be made, and the fact that this game contributed so much to the character speaks volumes when considering that this was Shaba's first chance at a Spider-Man game, and they were under a strict schedule, with added pressures from their corporate overseers that led to some of the more underdeveloped and poorly received aspects of the game. Fortunately, an aspect that didn't suffer was the score, which acts as a strong point for the game. Most ambient tracks are fine enough, but there are some standouts like the opening theme that not only features the fast notes bringing to mind the swift steps of a spider, but the high pitch of the first few notes followed by the low of the next are a perfect representation of the internal battle between Peter and the symbiote. Sound design is great here, with combat having the proper punch and every symbiotic movement is aided by a slimy effect, and the voice acting is great for a lot of characters. Almost all of them. The delivery of lines isn't perfect, and neither is the writing, often coming off as cheesy with an admittedly large amount of charm, but as many before me have mentioned, the voice for Peter is questionable at best. It's very whiny and over the top, but I don't think it's a blemish large enough to ruin the experience. It feels reminiscent of Peter from Ultimate Spider-Man, and that is about as much of a compliment as I can give it. Other characters sound fine, and I didn't notice any major inconsistencies, but the moment-to-moment -moment dialogue between characters is especially funny at points. Why does everybody talk crap about my costume? It's a classic. It's iconic. I was unaware that one of Iconic's definition was 
ugly as hell. <laughs> Truly, Web of Shadows' biggest strength is within its presentation and its animations. Every action here feels like it has power. In the black suit, Spider-Man shakes with power after each punch when not holding back, and in the classic threads, he holds back his power but not his speed, unleashing a flurry of attacks towards enemies. Yes, some of this looks like a Street Fighter combo, but it never enters truly ridiculous territory. Except when skating on an enemy. I'll admit that is leaving the realm of realism, but it's so much fun that I can't help but dismiss myself. Every attack from both suits combo into each other, and the tendril attacks specifically have always looked perfect. Some animations are weaker, like when diving, as Peter puts both hands forward and his little feet dangle in the wind, but otherwise the air looks as stylish as the ground. Swinging looks the way it should, and the different ways Peter can interact with the world is displayed beautifully. The web strike and its many variations have polish, which makes sense given how integral it is to this game, and the many games to come after. When I mention that certain aspects of the game receive more time than others due to certain restrictions, I hope from the footage you have seen thus far that the gameplay was not one of those facets. The gameplay in Web of Shadows is strange, because while it does contain some of the most fluid and enjoyable mechanics in a Spider-Man game, arguably to date, its level design and the context for you to engage in those mechanics are paper thin. The massive set pieces are good set dressing, but are often plastic shells guarding poor objectives, melting away under the heat of scrutiny. Typically, there are two facets to a Spider-Man game, combat and traversal. Many games before Web of Shadows were able to refine and enhance these two systems, but Shaba had ambitions to merge the two. Forget crawling on walls, how about breakdancing on them? Make use of swinging to give your kicks extra power, but power is not all that is on offer, as style is valued just as much as substance in Shaba's eyes. Form and function are treated equally culminating in gameplay that is just as expressive as it is at times broken. But before we look at where these two intersect, we should break down what makes them great individually. After all, it is the foundation for which the rest of the gameplay is built. Spider-Man wouldn't be Spider-Man without his webs. The swinging in Spider-Man games have up to this point been pretty good. They seemingly peaked in Spider-Man 2, regressing slightly in 3, but still providing fun. The physics-based implementation gave swinging weight and a proper progression. You began the game with little control, and by the time you finished, you were likely skilled enough to swing faster and with more precision. Web of Shadows brought the swinging back in full force. This swinging system has a low skill floor, but a very high skill ceiling, and one that I still don't believe I've hit yet. This is exactly what a traversal system should be. If you are a beginner, simply pressing and letting go of R2 will allow you to look like Spider-Man, fulfilling any surface level fantasy. But web climbing, swinging on poles both vertically and horizontally, running up and down walls, web zipping up and across buildings, it's exhilarating at top speed and is a newfound control when accustomed to the more restrictive if more stylish insomniac swinging. Improvisation and planning both have a place here and executing both with consistency will take great skill. There is a perfect risk and reward system here because not only is the more stylish abilities like web zipping across the sides of a building building flashier, but it's more effective too. Jumping is a fine means of heading into traversal, but pressing R2 will send you farther. Running up a wall is effective, sure, but slinging yourself up that wall at top speed to then blast over the horizon taps into this immersive side of the game. No matter your motivations, you will be rewarded for engaging in the movement here. The issue is that you may not be aware of such depth or features. For a Spider-Man game that is so heavy on tutorials, you think that they would dedicate more time to Spider-Man's most iconic ability. Perhaps they figured players knew the movesets well enough. Previous installments had systems of a similar depth, and as the MCU skipped Uncle Ben as an acknowledgement of the success of prior films, Shaba skipped the swinging tutorials as an acknowledgement towards the previous game's success, and put more time into teaching new combat systems to account for previous failures. Spider-Man 3's, 2's, Ultimates had respectable swinging, but it was the combat in Spider-Man 3, among many other things, that let fans down. Shifting a focus to overhauled combat seemed wise, but its heavy-handedness is often unnecessary, and at points, never-ending. Regardless, by the end of a playthrough, there is no doubt that you'll be capable of virtually flying across a map. As your skills progress, so will your speed. An interesting idea that Web of Shadows implements is the spider tokens, of which there are... <clears throat> 2,000. With each hand full eventually barrel full of tokens collected, you'll receive a speed increase to your swinging. On one hand, this feels counterintuitive. Why lock our speed behind a collectible, if at all? One of the most enticing parts of a Spider-Man game is the swinging, so why can't we go balls to the wall right away? On the other, it works for getting the player familiar with the swinging, acting as a means of training wheels. Your speed is capped to, I think, prevent frustration. When you are limited in how fast you go, you're given ample control to learn your skills and refine them. What can you do while practicing? Collect tokens, which will increase your speed, giving you a newfound velocity to get accustomed to. This process repeats, but ends before you've collected all the tokens. Each increase to your speed is barely felt, but when you increase it by 5 increments in half an hour, it's easy to see. When the token requirement reaches the hundreds, I find myself struggling to go out of my way for them because the progression is so slow it may as well not be there. This means a large portion of players will never hit the maximum swing speed. Speed is directly tied to enjoyment, as it requires more skill and rewards more satisfaction and efficiency. I think an alternative would be to only 
include 500. That is still an astronomical number that you would spend the game's length collecting, but it would mean getting greater swinging speeds faster. Another reason why this would work is because there are many points where spider tokens are handed out in bunches. Some roofs will have a handful laying around, and when you introduce these clusters, I am less likely to stop along the way for just one. I also find it strange that the tokens will not be rendered until close enough, meaning that individually hunting for them in even the early game can be a chore. Most players will plateau at approximately level 7 because the next step is just too large for the player to be bothered. I like the idea, and it helps more than I can explain that the sound of collecting these things is just intoxicating. <laughs> To cap off our discussion of the swinging, I'll explain that the only minor criticism is that the webs don't stick to buildings. I know this is a big issue for some, but I've never been concerned with it, though the addition would have been appreciated. The animation, scope of the story, and mechanics here already enter unrealistic territory, so a detail like this does not feel necessary. I also feel the need to point it out because it is the only thing I can think of that the system is missing. Everything is here, and Web of Shadows has some of the best swinging in the character's history, with endless amounts of fun and enough speed to crash my game on a few occasions. Having such a level of control does wonders for expression, but more importantly, it aids your transition from combat to traversal, to combat to wherever else you desire. The perfect symbol of Shaba's marriage between the combat and traversal is the now staple of the character, the web strike. Spider-Man has previously used his webs to stun, damage, throw enemies, but now he's going to use it to traverse his enemies. The web strike is not an attack, it is a transition. If you are wanting to engage in a fight, you web strike to initiate, and transition from swinging to striking. If you want to take a ground fight to the air, you toss an enemy up and close the gap with the strike, transitioning again. If after a brutal attack the enemy hits a wall, you can web strike once again to pivot the fight to the side of a building. Finally, once the enemy is weak, you can end with a web strike that'll send you skyward, transitioning you back to the air for traversal. Further variants of the web strike amplify its use. Want to send someone to the air? Press the circle button to toss them upwards. Want to simply bounce off the enemy? Hit triangle, and square will prompt the grind attack. This is the variant that'll do the most damage and is the only web strike that I'd classify as a proper attack. Even still, it can end with an enemy in the air or against a wall due to proximity. If you simply want to engage without sending them across New York, you can abandon the strike, ending up behind the enemy. The web strike, while having many uses for efficiency, aids the spectacle, as we can have gameplay that sends us miles across New York, and just as quickly as we smash through a storefront, we can sling back to our target. No building, area, or access is off limits, and it reinforces that this is the strongest Spider-Man we've seen. New cinematic heights are reached, and the boss fights are elevated to proper spectacles. Once you do enter combat, there are plenty of basic combos and abilities to pummel your enemies. On our red side, we have punches that do less damage than the average black suit strike, but come out quicker. Spins, kicks, and punches work like they should, and Spider-Man makes proper use of every limb. Both suits have basic punches and an uppercut for fast transitions, but that's about all the similarities the two suits have. Combos are performed by alternating between taps and presses of the square button, and while they can be difficult to pull off, even failure looks stylish, which to me is one of the combat's greatest strengths. Every attack has given so much care in terms of style that even if I were to fail a combo by tapping instead of pressing, I still look cool, but lose the reward of doing so intentionally. Pay attention to what's on screen, as it's about what you'll get. I could harp on about the individual combos, but it would be 20 redundant points to a system's depth. I hope my rant thus far has emphasized that the strength isn't in the combos or the individual attacks, but their fluidity and compatibility with each other. Every attack and combo leads into the next, and if it doesn't, it is one web strike away. The web strike has two sub-variants to the normal three, which are decided by your timing. There is a forgiving window to perform that basic strike, but attack with perfect timing and you'll see increased effects. Variable twists, higher range, it all offers more control and a reward for proper timing. The biggest reward will be the area of effect damage given to the strike, especially useful for some of the god-awful side missions in the game. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Didn't mean to get ahead of myself there. The crush variant of the web strike will likely be the most used attack, as it does a significant amount of damage, and by the end of the game, it becomes marginally better than other attacks and looks far flashier too. Why bother throwing someone in the air and taking them down with an air combo if it's going to take longer and look worse than skating on the enemy like Tony Hawk? This is a problem with the balance of the game, not in the damage of attacks, but in the style too. Conveniently, the most powerful attacks are often the most stylish. Your basic five hit combo will do the trick, and by no means do any of the attacks feel underpowered, but the web slam will eliminate many enemies in just one instance. Doubly so if you have the variable twists. The fist tornado will make any one-on-one -on -one encounter equivalent to fighting a running blender, and the same is true for the paddle ball air combo. If you want traditional combat, then you can utilize the guard ability present in both suits that, if used with proper timing, will parry the incoming attack. This makes one-on-one -on -one battles more engaging, especially against stronger foes. Surprisingly, the most balanced attacks are those that are meant to be. Your special attacks will use your special meter, and while doing significant damage and looking great, when they work, they are limited. 
limited, meaning that they were often reserved for boss fights, making those set pieces even more exuberant. I think they do teeter on the edge of being a free win button, as you build your special meter quickly enough, but by the end of the game your upgrades are less about damage and more about style. Combine all of these and we have a combat system that is as engaging as it is rewarding. But what are the differences between the red and black play styles? Enough to warrant using both. The major differences between the two suits is in their focus. The red suit will see you performing single target combos and using multiple forms of stuns for crowd control. Boss fights and brutes go down easier as you launch a, in some ways, literal tornado of punches at your foes, and your area of effect will typically leave enemies stunned, encouraging you to focus on one enemy at a time. Special abilities that damage a wide range will do so minimally, meaning that webbing up the opposition temporarily sets them aside so you can focus on a single target. An opposite sentiment is shared with the black suit, in that a majority of the crowd control is damage focused, and when the later upgrade are introduced, it becomes less fighting and more bullying. There is an issue that arises within the combat, in that the black suit in almost every facet is better than the red suit. If we look at pure damage, we can see that the black suit is capable of outputting more, even having the ability to throw cars and have more options in general. One upgrade sees you using your tendrils to pull an enemy close to you. This means you can not only pull yourself to an enemy, but them to you. If there is a group, then you have the option to engage all at once or isolate one. This extra damage applies to the special attacks too. The most powerful being the beatdown, which sees our symbiotic slinger pouncing at the enemy and simply punching them while straddling across. It sounds simple, but just look at some of these health bars. Boss fights are a cakewalk, and any regular enemy won't survive either. When opting for crowd control, you'll see the tendrils are more effective, spawning cyclones of slimy tentacles, which look far better than any of the attacks from the red suit. It has the damage, the spectacle, and the utility. This is an interesting means of presenting the moral choice in front of Peter. The suit performs better than he ever could. It even, despite not making him look like that guy from Aerosmith looks better. The consequences for this are his personality. He's more aggressive, assertive, and has a greater disregard for those around him. This is an interesting dynamic that has been presented well within the television series and comics, but not in any games because of a problem and its deceptive solution. This dilemma requires a proper consequence for the player, and a cutscene that simply states that the characters are unhappy with you for many is not enough. The easiest consequence in this case is to make the black suit easier or more fun. But then you have an imbalance in gameplay, and while that sounds bad, and perhaps to some it is, here it works beautifully thematically. The black suit should be better, in every way. If it was on the same level as the red suit, then there would be no justifiable reason for picking it aside from the aesthetic boredom. By keeping the gameplay in balance, we present a dilemma where the player must choose to sacrifice challenge or morals. Maybe you are struggling with a boss fight. Would you swap to the black suit for the added strength, even if it means straining the relationships around you? Your answer doesn't matter, because in gameplay your choice makes little to no impact, and the most significant determinant of your alignment is in your story choices. The game will pause and you'll be given the choice between red and black. We can analyze the decisions themselves in the vague nature of them later, but the focus for now is on their impact. These decisions are so valuable to your alignment that it renders your gameplay decisions useless, and I believe it should be the other way around. In fact, I think the decisions would be better if they were pre-decided by your alignment, which would hypothetically only be influenced in gameplay. As it stands now, it seems your alignment is calculated by actions like saving or hurting civilians, and completing certain objectives in either the red or black suit. Other factors could be used to aid the alignment, like the time spent in a suit and the damage dealt in said suit. Some of the most notable decisions come at the end of boss fights, and rather than make a conscious black and white decision, we could have the decision made for us based on factors like how much we used what suit during the fight. What we have now is similar to the infamous games, where it seems we make a decision at the beginning of the game to be a hero or villain, and never decide again. A saving grace here is that no powers are locked behind alignment, meaning regardless of morality, we can utilize both suits to their full extent, and the combat is at its best when you swap between suits on the fly, mid-combo. Swapping between the suits is at its peak by the end of the game. Upgrades are locked behind not only experience points, but also story progression. And by the time you have enough upgrades to effortlessly defeat bosses and enemies alike, the game is practically over. It's fortunate then that this game features a new game plus mode, though it is heavily obscured. You have to obviously beat the game and sit through the unskippable credits, which the game will close after finishing. Then you have to open the game and hit continue, where the credits will play again. The game will close again, and when you hit continue a second time, your new game plus run will begin just after the prologue. Despite the game taking no measures to inform you of such a mode, it is a great reward as everything carries over, skills and spider tokens included. I don't intend to sound like a Borderlands fan by saying the third playthrough is where the game gets really good, but truly, this third playthrough is where you have a full understanding of the controls and the abilities, and it's the most fun. You swiftly move from encounter to encounter, and instead of having epic battles against enemies, it's more taunting and playing with them like a dog with his favorite bone. There are plenty of ways to defeat your foes, but what do the enemies themselves have to offer? A sizable selection most being enjoyable and others being 
kind of tedious. Your basic starters are the Rolling Sevens and the Park Avenues. They carry bats and guns that are standard fare going down in just a few hits. While most are of a normal size, the heavy hitters are much larger and somehow can, with the swing of a bat, slam you across a city block. The heavy hitters are also harder to web strike, often requiring an over counter, and these variants carry over to the next class being the Kingpin's Private Militia. With technology developed by Adrian Toomes, the Kingpin's men have suits that allow them to take more and deal more damage, along with having greater traversal. Their heavies can walk and fight on walls, and some of their standard enemies can make use of goblin gliders that traverse the air. The enemies didn't offer much aside from more damage and traversal, but the mechs are the first kind of mini-boss that we will see. The mechs have armor that render your traditional attacks ineffective. You can still get by, but an easier route would be to give in to the Dark Temptation and throw a car at it to stun it. When stunned, a quick time event can at first rip off the minigun, and the second will take the pilot out of the mech. There is an issue that arises when disabling the minigun, which is that the robot will only use its shoulder-mounted rocket launcher. This will fire a near constant onslaught of explosives that will not only knock you back and do significant damage, but cancel your attack animations. If you were to try and throw another car initiating another stun, you would almost always not be capable of throwing said car before you are hit with a rocket, rendering this method visually appealing but frustrating in the same breath. Alternatively, you could stun it with a car that it already does significant damage, and just keep throwing cars while it's stunned. If you want to keep in the red suit, then you can use swing kicks to take down the robot, but I'd argue it isn't very glamorous. I wish the stun method was more viable, because it has the greatest spectacle of the three options I listed, but these enemies are scarce enough that I struggle to hold any major gripes. As you move on, you'll encounter the beginning of the symbiote line. These enemies are remixes of the enemies listed above, barring the mechs. Civilians will begin scuttling like Spider-Man and sticking to walls, too. Their attacks are claw-like slashes coming out quickly. These civilians begin looking like any other ordinary NPC, but as the infection grows, most will simply become zombies. Covered in white, purple veins, which, uh, side note, said purple veins look quite similar to spider veins, and I'm not sure if that was intentional, but that's a really fun detail. These enemies are simply fodder, going down in one hit and moving at a snail's pace. They function as set dressing more than enemies, as they instill this idea that a venom apocalypse is encroaching on the world. There are two variants of proper symbiotes that are the same size as a civilian, but have full use of their super-powered body. At the top of the food chain is the Berserkers that come in two flavors, a Carnage Red and a traditional Red and Blue. The Red and Blue ones are technically grapplers, but I couldn't find any significant differences between them. These brutes are a similar size to Eddie and provide what he can't a consistent battle between two venomous titans. These enemies are easily the toughest in the game, requiring precise timing for web strikes and a proper use of your defensive abilities. Not only are citizens given symbiote powers from Venom, but other villains too. When a major villain gets infected like Electro or the Vulture, they have time to breed their own symbiote offspring. The Vulturelings are no different from the glider enemies, attacking the same and going down the same way too. The Electrolings, on the other hand, inherit the worst qualities of its parent. They fire two ranged attacks. One is a projectile bolt that will cancel attacks and cause knockback, capable of interrupting a web strike. The other is a beam that'll do little damage, but after a few seconds will deal knockback too. The problem I always ran into with these little shits is that they would have perfect accuracy that interrupted all my attacks, including the web strikes I would use to get to these guys, as they would immediately fire at me upon my press of the triangle button. I had thought that perhaps I could cancel my web strikes and use the arc to jump over the bolt, and this worked, but they fire these bolts at such a rapid rate that even if I was right in front of them, this option was cut off. It felt as though nothing worked as every attack got interrupted or they teleported away, and I find this especially odd given that the two boss fights against Electro are well balanced and don't feature the same issue. This is because Electro's attacks come out at a slower pace, and they don't track you as well, leading to a greater window for dodging. This is true of both his first encounter and the symbiote fight later on, a theme present with every boss fight. In the first half of the game, you are introduced to a character through a boss fight, and after the prison break, you'll fight them in a symbiote form. These fights are incredibly fun, and there's a good amount of variety between the two fights, so even though you're battling Black Cat, for example, twice, there are different challenges to consider. The first time you encounter her, it's a simple one-on-one. -on -one. It's the first official boss fight in the game, so it makes sense that it's simple, and her second fight is on the tail end of the game. The only massive change is in her animations and damage. She has one of the largest health bars, and she is constantly surrounded by anywhere from 10 to 20 symbiotes. If this wasn't difficult enough, Mary Jane attempts to lend a hand, but quickly becomes a liability. Now we have to focus on Black Cat our own health bar, and protect MJ, and this juggling act is one of the hardest in the game. It was reminiscent of the Ultimate Spider-Man Electro boss battle, and it was quite enjoyable. A similar challenge is present with the two vulture fights, as they see you juggling the many enemies with tombs, and there's an added challenge of staying in the air. There are a handful of gliding enemies to help you stay in the air, but with enough skill, you can stay airborne through combat with tombs alone. The symbio fight is nearly the exact same, but with a greater scale. I don't usually enjoy excusing a recycled fight in the name of spectacle, but the set piece, context, and scenery is so different 
and gripping that I can't help but love this fight regardless. A boss fight with a unique mechanic is against Wolverine, but only the first time. When first meeting, Wolverine can smell your suit and isn't convinced that you were the real Peter Parker. In order to deduce if you are an imposter, he asks you a series of questions that function as a Spider-Man lore quiz. The more questions you get right, the shorter and easier the fight. Some of these questions were pretty obscure too, which was appreciated. His health, true to the character, will regenerate after each question. It's a great fight, but one that always lives in the shadow of its rematch. The imagery, design, backdrop, everything against Symbiote Wolverine is perfection. The angel statue being sliced in half by his exaggerated claws, the church backdrop contrasting the hell currently on Earth, and the design of a Wolverine covered in spikes is likely one of the best. Wolverine employs a similar strategy to Electro in that he gains power, or in this case, extra armor, from the symbiote pods, meaning you'll have to take them out while juggling the mutant. This is by far the only symbiote that would canonically come close to killing Peter, and the difficulty of the fight reinforces that. The final villain you will fight a total of three times is Venom. The first time is admittedly simple, given it takes place in the first ten minutes, but your second encounter is far more enjoyable. This time, he isn't holding back, and you have around half of your abilities. Venom moves and attacks like many of the Berserker symbiotes, with the added benefit of summoning allies. This second encounter is split between a fight and a chase. The fight itself suffers from claustrophobia as it feels restricted to a back alley, a cage match of brick walls, but when we get to the open streets, we can't attack him. Instead, we have to follow him as he consumes civilians until he ends up in the second walled-off arena. This slows the fight down to a crawl and puts us in a situation where we have no control or agency. Why not place us on top of a parkade, with plenty of stone barriers to crash through and cars to hurl each other's way? Something so enclosed restricts our freedom and more damning, it restricts the camera. Fortunately, this fight highlights Venom's movement. When a character needs to run, instead of having a proper sprinting animation, they just jog at a hilarious pace. I mean, look at this shit. The final fight with Venom is likely the wallpaper of Spider-Man fans across the world and was, until replaying this game, my favorite boss fight of the franchise. Venom, now having taken over all of New York and harvesting hundreds of symbiotes and innocents, is a kaiju-sized hydra. The Goliath to our David. When I said Web of Shadows prioritizes the spectacle above all, this is what I was referring to. The embodiment of our hero defying all odds. The battle between Peter and his aggressive thoughts, frustrations, ego, and unshackled power personified. It's an oxymoron. A beautiful finale to a game covered in sludge and disgust. It's too bad then that mechanically this fight feels lacking. Venom has five heads, all of which are out of reach, but when one intends to attack you, it'll lean forward, leaving it open for a web strike. Web strike the four heads three times, to take them down, and that's it. The timing is forgiving, and the enemies that Eddie summons do little to challenge, as they can't deal with you when you're in the air. Unfortunately, it seems the enemies are never ending. Defeating the symbiotes while dodging the larger foe is futile, as he'll just puke up more. Perhaps this was a subtle way of pushing the player to the air, but I had hoped for a fight with the real Venom. Maybe a team-up between Eddie and Peter to take down the symbiote that now has a mind of its own. Despite this, I'm still shocked that the team at Shaba were capable of pulling something so grand off under such tight deadlines. When the heads are taken care of, we have a quick time event that has so far capped off almost every fight in the game. I know many have qualms with quick time events, citing that they're boring or feel less interactive than proper gameplay, and I can understand this mindset. But with that said, I feel the quick time events are handled well here and were never too frequent. They only showed up during boss fights and are easy enough that you won't miss them by accident, and the aspect ratio of the cinematics change when they're present, so it's always clear when you should be paying closer attention. The benefit to QTEs here is that they are hilarious when you fail them. Some are just humorous animations of Spider-Man losing, but others are morbid. One in particular sees you throwing Black Cat off of a rooftop, and if you fail this input, she fucking dies. <laughs> so you may be asking yourself, gee, this sounds like the best game ever. I mean, deep mechanics, fun boss fights, an original story with plenty of set pieces? Why did this game get reviewed so poorly by critics and why are sales so low? While I can't speak on why somebody would or wouldn't purchase this game, I feel confident in the reason some weren't very receptive to the gameplay here. The foundations of Web of Shadows are deep, expressive, and intuitive, but Web of Shadows expects that gameplay to carry the runtime, and truthfully, it comes very close. It's only in repeat playthroughs and when properly analyzing what your actual goals are that you see that the level Level design is consistently similar, and to some, repetitive. Assuming you are completing every quest in the game, then you will have 26 main story missions and 60 side missions. 11 of those missions will feature boss fights, 5 of them rematches, and many others will feature a similar solution to the problems presented. It's typically a basic enemy that is less prone to web strikes that you, with enough skill, bully for a few minutes until they run out of health. Minor variations like the backdrop and whether they're fought on the ground or in the air add some variety, but these fights begin to feel similar after a while. Fortunately, because there are so many ways 
ways to approach an enemy, multiple playthroughs can thrive in attempting to juggle a boss as much as possible on one run, and then taking a boots on the ground beat down approach on another. There are an assortment of missions that feature you doing something useful like breaking the tinkerer out of prison, and in doing this you ride the rhino and use his brute force to make it through the prison walls. This is about as unique as things get, but even the more boring missions like escorting a convoy are brief enough to not overstay their welcome. The side quests are where you really start to question the design decisions. At first they seem manageable, and at first that is true, but they are deceptive. Look no further than the side quest to defeat enemies, one of the first you'll attempt. At first, it's only a handful at 25, then 75, then 150, for a total of 250 thugs. It's a bit excessive, but the combat is fun and who can say no to extra practice? Especially when compared to the other challenges like defeating 10 heavy hitters, swing kicking 10 enemies, and taking down 5 cars. It's clear that this is meant for players who love combat. The issue is that these will take up significantly more time and never change. For example, in the next act, you are tasked with defeating a total of 300 kingpin enemies. After that, it is a total of 1,000 symbiotes, and for virtually no reward. Yes, you are given experience, but merely completing a quarter of these quests will yield enough points to purchase every upgrade for both suits. What's worse is that some of them don't even allow you to flex your skills. Calling in an airstrike is fun, but being asked to defeat nearly 400 symbiotes by airstrike is a tall order that puts me to sleep. The best part is, these are the straightforward quests, and the more complicated, such as rescuing civilians, can take ages longer. In the beginning act, civilians are injured during other crimes at random and they need to be brought to the hospital. This isn't too egregious as you only have to do it three times, but by the second act, that increases to 18. 18 does not seem like that many, but the issue is that, at least on my playthroughs, civilians were only open to being rescued when their vehicles exploded. And even this is a chance. When their car explodes, they'll be sent into the air and you'll need to lock on and press circle to rescue them. This happens very quickly and you need to, rather true to the character, act fast. The issue is that sometimes you'll lock on to an enemy instead of the civilian. If this does happen, you often don't have time to course correct. Say everything does line up then you could still press circle and end up webbing a nearby enemy. I've also experienced issues of civilians flat out disappearing both in the air and in my arms. Overall, it was extremely boring, not even frustrating, just boring. I'd have to find a heavy hitter who could throw cars, wait for a car to explode, and then pray that everything worked out. I could at least find humor in Spider-Man intentionally putting a civilian in harm's way just so he can save them and play the hero. But back to the main point here, the side quests are just paper thin excuses to use your powers, which would be fine if the main missions were not on the same level at times. There are two distinct mission archetypes, those being original ideas and the others being side quests that ask you to perform a repeated action a few times over. The opening has the greatest density of these, but in fairness it makes sense to start slow at the beginning and hammer in the foundations. Typically you'll be tasked with a proper objective, and in between you'll be given activity activities to do around the city, which boil down to stopping crimes or saving civilians. When you first encounter a new enemy type, you'll almost always have a mandatory objective to defeat a certain number of them. On repeat playthroughs, it feels like filler, but despite this, I don't believe it interrupts the pacing too much, even when the game follows a clear pattern. It sees you meeting someone, finding out about a new enemy type, investigating by defeating a handful, and then discovering the source. Once the city succumbs to Venom, you discover a symbiote variant of one of the enemies, and then have a rematch against the source. It feels a bit formulaic, but the intrigue of seeing the new symbiote designs and the speed at which things move is done well. My only gripe would be that the city's nosedive is brief and happens mostly off screen. Everything seems mostly normal until we encounter Venom again, which then prompts us to leave the city for a memorable prison break and when we return the city is in ruins. Even this feels odd to criticize as I'm not sure how they could show this transformation without a ridiculous amount of added time and budget, something Shaba certainly didn't have in excess. Perhaps it's due to the set pieces being so enjoyable and over the top, or perhaps it's due to most objectives being odd variations of go here defeat X, but it seems that everything outside of the highs of this game are bland not necessarily on their own, but in comparison. We move from defeating a symbiotic wolverine in one of the most difficult and thrilling fights of the game to escorting a convoy, defeating a small handful of enemies with each push. It leads to a game that relies heavily on its core mechanics, and when those mechanics are built around only two things, traversal and combat, it can feel repetitive. Yes, vulturelings are a new enemy type, but they function the exact same as Kingpin's glider enemies. There are only so many ways to defeat a new group of enemies, and sometimes there is only one way. One of the earliest missions in the game is at the end of the first act, which sees the Rolling Sevens and the Park Avenues coming together for a parlay, but little do they know they're about to be ambushed by Wilson Fisk. You are tasked with eliminating 20 of Fisk's snipers through the use of web strikes. A bit excessive, but oh no, we have to do it again. Oh. 
Look, I know this mission has been beaten into the ground and the concept alone spells out its errors, so I'll move on. Instead, let's take a look at my personal biggest gripe, Fat Man Sings, which sees you enlisting the help of the Kingpin by entering Fisk Tower. How do you do this? By disabling the three generators around the tower that are powering an electric field. Once you do so, you can enter a cutscene in which the Kingpin makes a big deal about how you have to help him, and what a colossal task does he put in front of you? Reactivate the generators. Instead of fighting the Kingpin enemies to disable them, you fight a bunch of symbiotes. An added layer of challenge this time is that the generators can be redisabled by the symbiotes. But aside from the generators being rarely disabled, you're doing the same thing again. In fairness to the game, these two examples are the most egregious. While there are some uninteresting parts of the story, I can think of just as many enjoyable parts that offer scenarios that few games can match. It is exactly why I said this game has astronomical highs yet sub-zero lows. But all the main objectives here revolve around a central goal of stopping the symbiotes. How is that story executed? Fine. I wish I could give a more interesting take, but there are much like the rest of the game a near equal amount of pros and cons. The story it tells is original, features plenty of classic characters, and has branching paths that lead to different endings, but the story feels oddly unoriginal in some ways. Its characters not contributing as much as it could, and its branching paths are less a proper alternative and more a simple dialogue change with a single differing mechanic within a level, and a few different endings. The game opens with another encounter with Venom, this time not going well for both Peter and his love interest. While the two are on the edge of death, the Venom symbiote begins to bond to Peter's skin, allowing him to utilize its added strength and defeat Venom. Mary Jane is safe, but left with a broken arm, and Peter is thrusted into a gang war, but has Luke Cage as a heroic aid. As the two initiate a parlay between the rival gangs, they discover that the gang war was set up by Kingpin, leading the webhead to investigate downtown. As he is investigating, he runs into both Black Cat and Moon Knight, who help him track down Fisk. Internally, Peter is having issues with the black suit. He's had it before, and when he did, it put a great strain on their relationship. The prior events to the game are vague, and while the plot is original, it is safe to assume that the running themes and storylines have occurred prior. Peter has, through context clues, had the symbiote before, and even fought villains like the Green Goblin before. You're not the Hobgoblin or the Green Goblin. You're a cheap so we can assume that the symbiote previously had the normal effects of providing physical strength, but at the cost of moral fortitude, hence why MJ isn't very fond of it. As we continue, we have a run-in with the Vulture, and the story meanders into our second encounter with Venom, which sees his symbiote multiplying and infecting the local population. Peter attempts to learn more of the symbiote and how to stop it, but in the midst of this, Electro pops up and begins causing havoc. With the Venom symbiote multiplying, and with Vulture, Electro, and Kingpin on the loose, S.H.I.E.L.D. shows up, and Black Widow aggressively pushes for a solution. One of these solutions Peter lands on is is breaking an evil genius out of Rikers, the Tinkerer. He can create a sonic device that'll stop the symbiotes, but by the time we return to New York, the place is a war zone. And S.H.I.E.L.D. has set up its last defenses at Stark Tower while destroying the bridges leading out of the city. We spend our time saving civilians and assisting the Tinkerer, whilst taking down some of the earlier villains who have been consumed by the alien organism. As we track down Mary Jane and Luke Cage, ensuring their safety, we arrive at the Tinkerer's device, only to get word that Venom has been spotted on top of the S.H.I.E.L.D. helicarrier. We head up there to take him down for good, and the game ends with four different endings. Two for each alignment. The two endings boil down to two major decisions, one of which you decide, and the other is one that is decided for you based on your alignments. The decisions presented to you are simple and are presented as a good or evil decision. I believe there is a reason these choices are so underdeveloped, but for now, let's look at what they are and what their impact is. Choices most commonly appear at the end of a boss fight. The first is during the gang war. Spider-Man can choose the red route and explain to the gangs that they need no reason to fight, and the black route sees you withholding said information and taking down both gangs in the process. Process. The decision is fine and as a beginning decision makes sense. You either do the right thing or pick the selfish option that opts for a more permanent solution. Is it out of character? Yes. But Spider-Man has seen both frustration and critiques of the justice system and how every villain he puts away will inevitably come back. So him deciding to stay out of it and let the gangs continue to kill each other at least follows a reasonable justification. The second choice is after defeating Black Cat. It sees her confessing her love for you and your choice is to either lay the spider pipe or stay faithful to your ongoing relationship with Mary Jane. My issue with this is decision is that it feels too out of character for an early game decision. You might compare this to later choices where Peter decides to destroy the device that'll stop the symbiotes and say that killing millions or at least dooming them to being zombies is far worse than cheating, but that decision is at the end, after you have let the suit dictate your decisions and after you have built up ten other immoral choices. Whether you believe infidelity is a cardinal sin or a minor road bump, it doesn't feel as justified as other decisions. An inherent part of Spider-Man's character is his rock-solid morals. I know that the suit will obviously influence him and this is one of the few games where Spider-Man Spider-Man can actively become the villain, but he, at this point in the game, should still be just barely under the suit's influence. It's in this decision that we see this ideology manifested. Can't do that. And you know it, Felicia. Can't or won't. Same thing. 
His morals are so solid that to him, not wanting to hurt others is a physical restriction. It is simply not an option. It leads to a black route choice that feels unrealistic for me. And that's not even delving into the ethics of Spider-Man dating a criminal. Ultimately, Felicia serves a role as the black route's companion, and one that is opposite to Mary Jane. MJ reassures Peter of his morals and his responsibilities, and Felicia encourages his ego. This decision could be interpreted as less a rejection of Mary Jane, and more a rejection of responsibility, in which case my issues are nullified. The next decision is picking between Moon Knight or the Vulture to carry you to the prison. I can't understand why you would in any case pick Tombs, as he's a villain and untrustworthy. Even in a black suit run, picking someone like Moon Knight who has the people's best interest in mind is the optimal move, but I feel like I'm entering nitpick territory because this decision makes no difference aside from who drops you off. When in the prison, you get a different decision, which is to, while freeing the Tinkerer, free the Rhino as well. The black suit justification is that Peter may need help from him down the line, and I think this is a great choice. It is the epitome of Peter sacrificing his morals, putting a criminal back on the streets, in order to even the odds. The city looks like ground zero, so such drastic times can surely come with drastic measures. It's a choice that, while not ideal and not entirely in line with Peter's character, is one easily made when under the influence of the symbiote. The next major decision is done well again. The Red Route sees you encouraging Electro to fight the symbiote, but the Black Route has Peter beating it out of him and manipulating his grief for his dead sister, pinning the blame for his sister's death on the symbiotes and Venom, inciting a quest for revenge rather than coming to terms with his trauma. This decision is malicious, but not without benefit. It's important to remember that the symbiote doesn't make Peter an evil supervillain. It just makes him more selfish and aggressive. It exacerbates his negative qualities, not make new ones. But perhaps that is up for debate after finishing his encounter with Wolverine. In the red path, you encourage him to fight the suit, and in the black path, you tear his body in half. There's not much to say here. It's brutal, it's unnecessary, hell, it's even a bit cheesy, but it works. Especially so far into the game where Peter begins to really buckle under pressure. The next decision with Black Cat is the same as before. You are, on a more impactful scale, choosing between her or MJ. This is the decision that decides what variant of ending you receive, and I think it's fine the way it is. The penultimate choice with the Vulture is decided for you, and it works well. A red alignment will see you activating the device, and a black alignment will see you destroying it instead. You engage in the cutscene expecting a decision to come up, but instead you have your choice made for you. The final decision sees you either killing Venom or attempting to save him, which results in him taking his own life. A red ending will see you getting MJ and having a final swing, unless you save Felicia, in which case MJ will not return Peter's calls, and it leaves Peter with more of a somber and bittersweet victory. A black ending will have Peter take over New York, usurping the symbiote throne and realizing his power, with support from Felicia or without her support if you opted not to save her. Both black endings have a scene that shows the remaining members of S.H.I.E.L.D. releasing Wolverine with the symbiote again to defeat Peter. The decisions are fine, but they definitely feel as though they were tacked on. The biggest proof of this is in their impact. While most of the decisions in a vacuum are fine, it's when you see what they actually change, or rather don't change, that the choices seem hollow. The largest change for almost every choice is a different cutscene. Anything outside of two minutes after a choice are identical. When a choice shows up, you enter a bubble, and the moment you exit that bubble, it's as if no choice occurred. The gang war has a new objective where you eliminate some of the thugs. The vulture choice is just a difference of calling the cops on him or not, which have no visible effect. Choosing Moon Knight or Vulture doesn't matter matter. Freeing Rhino adds him as a hero you can call on, but chances are you forgot that you can call on heroes and villains at all. The only decision that does make a difference is choosing to save Felicia or not, as they influence your ending. And the most influential turning point is the choice of the device, that is decided by previous alignment. It changes the final assault on the helicarrier, as you have every hero and villain helping you, and you'll be locked into the suit matching your alignment. This is the only notable change, and it has an impact on gameplay, which I loved. I know I've harped on these choices a lot, but there is something in my monkey brain that goes absolutely ape shit over decisions, especially moral ones, and these choices are full of untapped potential. Many could have been improved, but it was clear that it was done to tick a box more than anything. The higher-ups at Activision had pressured Chaba to include decisions in the game, claiming that gamers love it, and while we do, I mean, I just rambled about that shit for a page, it's on the condition that they feel like real choices. Here, they are a choice you make at the beginning of the game and never again. It's a shame that this game was plagued with such demands, because the influence of the suits are felt in every part of the story. The choices are one area, as regardless of choices, the exact same story beats are hit, and the lack of interesting side content and menial objectives in between main missions indicate a time limit that restricted creativity. I feel like my expectations are coming across as though I want two entirely different playthroughs to occur. That would be unreasonable to ask of a team, but changes to even objectives could have been made to make decisions worthwhile. Rather than return to Black Cat upon defeating Electro, have a mission where you and Electro team up to take down symbiotes together. But what can we learn from the story, not the decisions? If one had to guess, time is a factor yet again. We have Peter and his story, Victor 
him again to the villain in a black suit. Venom is the main antagonist here, but has brutally little screen time, roughly 20 minutes out of the two hours of cutscenes. This is especially problematic when we see that most of these interactions act as bookends to the story. The beginning and ending encounters are the inciting incidents and the climax, but the midway encounter comes across as the story saying, yeah, don't worry, he's still out there doing his thing. As the story progresses, it meanders from the gang war until you encounter Venom again, but the issue isn't necessarily the lack of story beats, but the lack of our main antagonist. I don't mean to say that the second act is unnecessary, it lays the groundwork and establishes villains that will return in the third act with the symbiote, and while I can certainly agree with the previously mentioned criticism, I'd like to propose something else. I have seen the villain of this game to be the symbiote, not Venom. Not Eddie. If this is the case, then our villain gets plenty of screen time. The symbiote's influence is felt and fought by Peter throughout every interaction, and its silent takeover while still invisible for most of the second act is present. The real villain of Web of Shadows is power, and the corruption that comes with said power. The rogues gallery are all corrupted by the symbiote and use its powers to enact their own forms of domination and kickstart an evolutionary jump. Peter himself struggles with this. If you let the alien corrupt him, he'll remark about his new power and realize that his moral ties are simply shackles that he himself holds the key to. These themes are discussed in greater depth with your allies in optional conversations. Black Cat has an optional conversation about Peter Parker. She wonders why he bothers performing such incredible feats as Spider-Man just to spend the other half of his life as Peter. This is a reasonable question to ask, but it showcases is Felicia's fundamental misunderstanding of Peter Parker. This conversation also works as a means of planting the seeds that would see Spider-Man abandoning his alter ego altogether. Optional conversations range from the insightful like these to excuses for Spider-Man to riff fat jokes about Kingpin. Kingpin has launched a massive operation tonight. What? He made dinner plans? One in particular with Luke Cage surrounds the gang war and why gangs bother committing so many crimes in the first place. It dabbles into some commentary on gang lifestyle that almost feels out of place, especially when the likes of this are within the same hour. Sundown, eh? Well, you got it, Sheriff Luke. Deputy Spider-Man will get that rascally varmint. Most of the dialogue here is fine enough, but this game has its share of cheesy lines and questionable sentences. Overall though, characters do their job well, and while I wish we saw more from Eddie, he, more than anyone else, seemed to be a victim of the symbiotes. When the symbiote first came to Eddie, he was powerless, and it's this new power that corrupted him. Imagine the intoxication that then comes from having enough power to launch an invasion on the city. But by the time Eddie grows a symbiote to unprecedented heights, he can't control it. Eventually, it becomes clear to him that the symbiote controls him, as it literally puppeteers him with toxic marionette strings, so his death feels like a final act of agency. Eddie knows he can't stop the invasion, and his death will mean nothing to the infected, the symbiote, or anyone else but him. Of course, this is taken away from him if you go down the black route. It's not that you're taking away his life, Eddie is too far gone by now, but you've taken away the little power he has left. Other characters appeared as though they were featured as a means of buffing out a roster more than anything else. Cage, Wolverine, and just about everyone else goes through no change in the story, and Peter only has an arc when going down the black route, as it presents the downfall of Spider-Man from Heroes to villain. An issue that is present here is that there is a disconnect from the player and Peter's intentions. In the story, Mary Jane constantly berates Peter for keeping the black suit, and asks that he doesn't use it. Despite me not using the suit at all, she was still getting mad at me for having it. So it leads me to believe that originally the story was meant to have a linear scripted conflict within Spider-Man, where even if he doesn't actively use the suit all the time, he feels like he needs it as a safety net. It might explain the odd ways Peter acts during a strict red suit run, where in cases such as Mary Jane equipping a shotgun and claiming that she can take care of herself, Peter has a con descending tone as if she's just a child. You know what? MJ can take care of herself just fine. I still have friends out there. Luke and I are gonna go get them and then we're gonna get out of here. Aren't we, Luke? Okay. Just, wow. Just be careful, okay? It also explains moments where Peter claims he has to use the suit just one more time despite us on a black route using the suit all the time and disregarding Mary Jane and the events leading to said cutscene. Just one more time! There are other memorable parts of the story, like the different dialogue lines depending on your alignment, and any scene with Luke Cage squeezing himself into a car, but otherwise, a lot of plot lines here are without resolution. Its creativity and sheer extremities will be what many remember most. Scenes with Electro and Wolverine revealing their symbiote forms were shot beautifully, and the scene where the symbiote Vulture speaks to the crew through a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent's helmet is top-notch horror-esque presentation, but there is otherwise little in the way of overarching themes. Carries part of us with him. In fact, he is the reason we are here at all. Uh... This one's no longer useful. <clears throat> Good day. It doesn't mean there aren't great details. One of my favorite is during a mission where you escort some civilians back to the S.H.I.E.L.D. quarantine zone. You'll pass through the barrier, and if you're in the black suit, you'll swap to the red suit. And if you're already in the red suit, then nothing will change. It's a meaningless detail, but a nice one, and balanced out by two kingpins being on the screen in some cutscenes. <laughs> 
It's hard to criticize something like this because I honestly thought it was hysterical. While Web of Shadows has a good plot despite its issues, it isn't a wholly original one. Venom and the symbiotes and having the black suit is done well here, but it isn't the first game to attempt this kind of story. Spider-Man 3, both the movie and game, had released just a year prior to Web of Shadows. Many audiences were being introduced to Venom for the first time and their first impression was not a good one. A few years before that, we had Ultimate Spider-Man which also featured Venom, but was done far better than 3. Shaba Games have gone on record before stating that the failure of Spider-Man 3 put pressure on the development team to get Web of Shadows right. One bad game is a fluke, but two is a streak. This works both for and against the game. It works against it because we have two games in a row where the symbiote plays a major role. It benefits the game because it assumes you know the story. It's assumed that the player knows how the symbiote works, and attempts to take such a threat to new heights, and does so with flying colors. It could be assumed that audiences were becoming fatigued with all the alien life forms, and perhaps this is why Web of Shadows didn't sell well enough. I could easily compare the story to those of the first Uncharted games. They are fun, but fall apart the moment you ask too many questions. It's not memorable for the moments of character vulnerability and sincerity, but for its spectacle. And I don't believe that this story attempted to be more than that. It's clear that much like everything else in the game, with more time it could have been better, fleshed out more, but instead the time and budget constraints have done all they could to sleep their claws into this game and shackle a product worthy of so much more. This game, and its story more than anything, feels like an apology for Spider-Man 3. Overall, Spider-Man Web of Shadows seemed to have both suffered and thrived in the shadow of its predecessors. Spider-Man 3's failure put pressure on the team to create something greater, and while they used their predecessor's work as a blueprint for what not to do, their restricted budget and time meant that there was less room for their creativity to flourish. Many ideas that were implemented were corrupted by market testing and the want for features the team didn't want to add in the first place. The decisions feel tacked on because they ultimately are. The story was never meant to include these choices and I think it suffers from them as it leads to inconsistencies. The gameplay was the most ambitious ambitious and the best fulfilled feature the team set its eyes on. The bridge gap between traversal and combat making the marriage between the two seamless, while also being fully competent on their own, incredible. It created gameplay that was visceral from every angle, and was enough to entertain even if the excuses for using your abilities were shallow. The game also struggled to showcase and encourage players to experiment with the combat, leading many to assume the depth simply wasn't there. The game will force you to use the web strike over 50 times in the first hour, but you're never encouraged to swap suits mid-combo, or juggle an enemy in the air, or make use of the suit's strengths, or web zip up and over buildings, across buildings, swing on poles. While it could be argued that these abilities are inferred and discovered through experimentation, perhaps they assume players would press all the buttons to see what they do, but judging by the reviews, this was not the case. Fortunately, it doesn't take much to see and appreciate the atmosphere and spectacle of Spider-Man Web of Shadows. Every boss fight chased through the city, and post-apocalyptic backdrop presented high-octane fun that was amplified further by an excellent score. The menial tasks in between were repetitive but are balanced out well by the number of original and engaging ideas. The side quests weren't great, but they were intended to be something you chip away at, akin to an MMO though having the quests disappear after certain missions renders this vision nullified. Boss fights and other encounters by the end of the game do teeter on bullying, but this is earned through a mastery of its controls. Progression moves at a steady pace allowing you to experience plenty of features from both suits by the end of the game, and the spider tokens enable swinging to become much faster assuming you have the skill needed to sustain such speed. New York has never looked this good or this distraught, though by the end of the game our hero is able to save the day. The same cannot be said for Shaba. After making one of the more influential Spider-Man games, they were met with scathing reviews from the likes of IGN, and a Metacritic score not much better than their predecessor. Was it a step in the right direction? Yeah but it wasn't enough to save the studio that was shut down merely a year later. At the time, the game was perceived by many as just alright, and in its following years it became what would come to mind when you hear the words, underrated. But is that still the case? One search on Google will have you believe that it is. But perhaps that's a bad way to gauge public opinion. YouTubers are often forced to exaggerate their titles to survive, prompting the hailing of a good game as a masterpiece, or a perfect game to drive more clicks and discussion. The internet as a whole is a poor avenue to judge public opinion. From my experience, I've seen so many people call Web of Shadows underrated that I no longer believe it fits that title. If the general public opinion is that the game is underrated, then I would say it means the game is finally getting the respect it deserves. I wouldn't go as far as to say the game is overrated, but I feel that the game these days gets the appreciation it deserved, and I love that. This game is quite special to me because it's one of the few games from my childhood that holds up under scrutiny, and still glitters when the rose-tinted glasses break. To be fair, I was playing the Wii version as a kid and the controls were certainly not ideal, but the game was still so good and such a fun ride that doesn't overstay its welcome, barring the side quests. I think this Spider-Man game is one of the greats, and is at the second highest place on my list of Spider-Man games that desperately need a remake. 
Sorry, I, I love this game, but Ultimate Spider-Man still tops that list. It's unfortunate though that if a remake were to be greenlit, likely in the same reality where pigs fly, it would succumb to the same constraints that held this game back. The development would be rushed, the budget strict, and the idea stunted by something that can't be avoided. If not by forced choices, then by forced microtransactions. Whether we like it or not, ideas this grand need the power that these large publishers provide, and we as a consumer must sit idly by as their symbiotic relationship evolves into a parasitic one, and eventually, a vampiric relationship. One where a new studio is drawn in by the promise of mentorship, budget, marketing, and opportunity, only to have their spirit drained and their corpse spit out, or in this case, their doors closed. Hi everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. I appreciate it, it was a lot of fun to make. And I wanna say thank you to our patrons and our YouTube members. Your names are on screen right now and you are helping to keep the channel afloat. And if you guys want to see these videos a few days early, you can click the link in the description to become either a YouTube member or a patron and you'll get that. You can also follow me on Twitter, though I currently, maybe I'm aging the video by talking about this, but it looks like Twitter might die or something. So if that's the case, I'll be moving to whatever the new Twitter ripoff is. Uh, but for now, it's still Twitter, so you can follow me there. You can also check out the Polar Opposites podcast in the description. Uh, it's a podcast hosted by myself and Nam's Compendium, where we kind of talk about games, movies, and if you guys like Spider-Man, we actually have a video where we rank all of these Spider-Man movies. So if you want to check that out, there will be a link to that in the description. And thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Always, always lovely to work with Brilliant. I, I really liked working with them on the skate video. And yeah, plans for the rest of the year are a infamous compilation, uh, similar, very much the same as my Arkham compilation. And then I'm working on another video that I will not talk about. A little secret for you guys. <laughs> so, okay, uh, I'm gonna go get back to work. I'm currently in final season and I have to figure out how to get a 12 page uh, research essay done in the next eight days. And I, I, fuck man, I don't know. So we'll figure it out. And yeah, take care. I love you guys. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you in the next one.